Local News. <laughs> Hi everyone, welcome back to the Navigant Credit Union Broadcast Center. I'm Go Local News Editor Kate Nagel. Thanks for joining us for the 4 o'clock news and politics show. We'd like to welcome Bob Wickham in. Hello, Kate. Appreciate you? your joining us nice this Friday. You. It's been a busy Friday afternoon yeah, here in the sure. studio. Yeah. 2 o'clock we had Olivia King in the Alex and Ani Lounge. Molly had a food Friday, oysters and allergen-free Zeppelis and cookies and goodies from A&J Bakery. But now to news and politics. That's the great thing about coming over here, a lot of free food. <laughs> not, not the usual intravenous feeding that I mean, it's There's some goodies real, in real the green food. room that we'll get All to right. later, but I'm glad you're here, Bob, because there's a lot going on. And from your former Providence Journal days, yeah, yeah. I do have to ask you about the story that Go Local did this week. Columnist Mark Patinkin, no, his uh, Instagram uh, alter ego. Social, social media this, stuff. This, is this indicative of the of the pitfalls of social media? Well, yeah, I, I was just very surprised that Mark, who uh, has always been very pleasant with me, very congenial, I was surprised he was saying those things on social media, not real, realizing it could bite him back. It's out there forever. I know they took the stuff down, but somewhere in the inner recess or in the Carlsbad caverns <laughs> of the internet, that stuff is there. I don't know why he would say those things. And, I don't understand why somebody so old, almost as old as me, if that is biologically possible, <laughs> uh, would, would try to uh, sound hip. That's the word. Yeah. Well, like a slightly obscene 23 year old. I don't get it. I'm, I'm just, I'm mystified. Doesn't well, sound like the Mark Patinkin I've spoken with. We'll see what happens moving I don't, forward. I don't get it. I don't get it. I thought the, the Pro Joe's approach to it was very strange. First of all, he was defended by the editor, and then. <laughs> And then the publisher felt compelled the next day to apologize for it without mentioning the name. Uh, you know, without mentioning the name of the perpetrator. So uh, the, the whole thing is very strange. I guess it was a huge uh, blowback. Well, again, yeah. I have talked yeah. with other folks as yeah. well who had yeah. mentioned, people who work with youth especially, Pilar yeah. McLeod yeah. with the Providence uh, NAACP yeah. youth branch and others as well, talked about how kids are warned at a young age to be careful about what they say, especially yeah, as they apply to college and jobs. I mean, he's been a columnist since the mid-80s, mid-1980s, I'm sorry, 1880s maybe. <laughs> uh, and I, I'm just surprised he would say those things online. I and mean, we all say things we regret. I've said a few things I've regretted on social media too. <coughs> but they're usually about, <coughs> excuse me, about politics, policy, something like that. Maybe the occasional ad hominem attack. <laughs> To, and then defensive recoil, you know, but not that kind of language. Uh, it's really, it's too bad. Well, I, I thought think it was a mistake, and I think he realizes it. Get I, your take yeah. on it here while we have you here. I just don't understand why the publisher didn't mention his name, since everybody would quickly find <laughs> out what the name was. I mean, it's just, you know, I don't know, very, very strange. Unimportant. In, the, in geological times. <laughs> in geological times. Or time. even meteorological times. <laughs> in geological terms. And speaking of time, and speaking of taking time to yeah. digest things, I had you in here right after Matt Brown had announced yeah. that day that he is eyeing, again, the exploratory committee hasn't fully yeah. tossed the hat in yet, but really eyeing it. Yeah, I think you, he can you, win. I think he can run as independent, can simply win. Everything's sliced up, you know, without the uh, instant, uh, what do they call it, Re uh, not recount. Runoffs. Right? Instant runoff, mm. thing, which I favor. I like the instant re uh, runoff system, which they've been debating in Maine for a long time, mm. as you probably know. But I think he could win. He's very personable. He's quite articulate, quite charming. He's got some charisma, a lot more than Alan Fung. For example, the, the mayor of Cranston is very likely to be the Republican nominee. Uh, and the, uh, the governor's uh, charisma comes out in small groups, but not in front of large ones. So you, think, you think Matt yeah. could, could, could I split, think he could do it. Yeah, vote. I mean, he's got, I mean, it's been a long time since he was in state general office. He was in Washington for a long time. He's been back in the, in the, uh, in the old country, so to speak, for <laughs> four or five years, uh, but he's got his ear to the ground, he, and he's got friends all over the state. I think he could probably raise some money, and uh, I think, I th actually think he could win as an independent. Um, everything is so sliced up. The, you know, the Tea Party people will go that way. Uh, <laughs> one, of the, one of the problems of Mayor Fung is, to, is, as Scott McKay over at Rhode Island Public Radio and other people do, I think of you people do, is that the, the people who turn out, <coughs> excuse me, primaries, tend to be the more extreme mm. types. So the Tea Party people, the, the gun nuts and that crowd, a lot of them from kind of what I call uh, <coughs> Appalachian, Rhode Island, which is, you know, West Greenwich, Exeter, Burrowville, stuff, uh, you know, very, very right wing. They tend to like people like Trillo, Joe Trillo, want Mike Runner as independent himself. Uh, 
So this is going to make it tough for uh, Mayor Fudd. He has to sort of appeal to them, but then he has to get in, you know, win in the general election. So. Well, speaking of primaries, know, we had really tough. We had Bob Flanders in this week. We've <coughs> yeah. had Representative Bobby Nardarillo in yeah. before, both yeah. eyeing yeah. the GOP nod right. in the U.S. Senate race. So you know, Bobby Nardarillo came out against Flanders taking money from uh, both Democrats and Republicans. Right. And right. Flanders came in and was unabashedly bipartisan and said, yeah, you know, I, 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 I'll yeah. work across the aisle. I said, can you get yeah. out of the primary? Well, well, <laughs> Flanders is really sort of a whole fa kind of a chafy Republican, basically. His problem would be a lot of people vote against him if, if he gets the general election, which I think he will, uh, because they're afraid of adding to the Republican caucus. You know, they don't want Mitch McConnell to be the leader of the Senate again. <laughs> so I think it's kind of what happened with Link Chafee when they vote, people voted for Sheldon Whitehouse instead of Link. Uh, Link, uh, you know, they might have liked Link. They may have even preferred Link in many ways, but they didn't want to add to the Republican control. You know, they didn't want to... Was they anybody, want to anybody but Lott? Was that... Was yeah, that? yeah. Uh, so I, I think that's sort of it. I think it's been actually a very interesting year. One can get bored with politics and its relentlessness, but I think all these independent candidates are uh, very interesting. And then, of course, the Democratic Party here and in California and some other places is leaning, leaning further and farther left. Uh, the uh, Gina Raimondo is really an old-fashioned kind of Truman Democrat, basically, you know, kind of lunch pail Democrat. Uh, but the, the progressives, uh, who are more Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, they're going to, you know, they present a serious problem to the governor. But let's talk international politics. You talk about a lot of the party turning yeah. left. But let's talk about the Democratic Party yeah. maybe turning right, Connor Lamb, Pennsylvania. Well, yeah, Trump I think country. they're learning. I think there is a, there's a progressive, then there's a sort of progress, uh, pragmatism. And, and Connor, uh, what's his name, uh, Lamb, is very. Uh, very much kind of a throwback, really, kind of Truman, Roosevelt, you know, socially li uh, liberal on economics, you know, protect the so social safety nets, pro-union. On the other hand, he's opposed to, quite avidly opposed to abortion, um, and he's very leery of, uh, you know, liberating or liberalizing immigration rules. You know, he would, he would be alien. a very conservative, yeah. uh, he would be a Republican here. <laughs> he might be, he might be, even though the Republican Party, you know, in Rhode Island is you know, moving right too. It's, uh, you know, things have changed a lot. You look at the voting pattern in the 2016 election, you know, all those, those, uh, those towns in Rhode Island that voted for Trump, you know. Uh, the, uh, it's almost, a, it's almost a, an image of the country, the coastal area voting blue, the, the hill area, the inland hills voting red. Well, we'll see what happens here in Rhode Island, but yeah. let's talk a little bit about D.C. and yeah. the shakeups in the Trump administration. Yeah, wild. F it? Firing yeah. by tweet. You know, it was interesting. Firing by tweet, right? We Don't tell them. It's like the, the, the guy who uh, was a Texas instrument who fired uh, 2,000 people by email about 10 years ago. Then he was fired himself, so there is a guy. Well, Jennifer Lawless down at American on Tuesday when she Skypes in pointed out how much of a polar opposite of a tactic for the president who very publicly yeah. in person would fire you on The Apprentice. Right. You're and, fired. <laughs> and now people are let go and they find out by tweet and he tells them three well, hours later. <laughs> apparently, apparently he doesn't like, and this is true for a lot of bullies, he actually doesn't like to do a lot of this stuff uh, in person. You know, the, I was always brought up when I was in the position of fire people, always fire them Praise them remotely, fire them in person. He doesn't like to do that, which is a huge characterological flaw, of which, of course, the only characterological <laughs> flaw that he has. I should say that. Uh, but yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a terrible way of working because it's going to be very difficult for him to get good people to work for him. So he's basically been reduced to getting these sort of TV stars like Larry Kudlow, who is always wrong, you know, the, the economist in quotes. Uh, you know, who, who, by the way, had a great, I put at the top of my column this, this quote from him. In, in December of 2007, he said, he, he denounced the pessimistas, he called them. He's, he's pretty clever at coming up with these phrases. Pessimista. He said the economy, pessimistas, who uh, said the economy was going to go into recession. Of course, this was about, this was about three months before the collapse of Bear Stearns and seven or eight months before the crash. So, I mean, he, and most of it, all, almost all of his predictions have been wrong. We talk a he's lot. He's a new economic <laughs> advisor, but he's good on television. Has very nice suits. So we're seeing what's coming out of D.C. and yeah. what, obviously yeah. the big question coming out now is where is Mueller at? And looking at uh, Trump Inc., if you will, yeah. dealings with Russia. I mean, yeah. is this the most 
that we've gotten an indication that the heat really is on the president and his operations. Himself yes, this the week. problem is, but he still hasn't he still hasn't directed the government, you know, the FBI and CIA and everything to really fight back. The reason is very clear. There are two there are two reasons, and the two at least one and two reasons interwoven: blackmail from his activities in Russia. Uh, he'll, and, and financial, purely financial connections. He's gotten a lot of money from them over the years. The whole Trump organization has. So this is corruption. There's been tons of collusion. And, uh, you know, he, he doesn't know how to deal with that. Because Putin, Putin, Putin's got stuff in it. And Putin kills people. He has people murdered. And he's a tough guy. And I think Trump's terrified of him. Well, and when we Still, talked when we talked with yeah. Lawless, that was her thought on you know Tillerson's ouster because yeah, he basically yeah. agreed with Theresa May that the Russians right. had their hands oh, yeah, in yeah, the, yeah, the assassination uh, over yeah, in Putin London. Mur <laughs> yeah, Putin tried to murder those people. He's had other people murdered. Uh, he thinks nothing of it. He's a, he's not a hot murderer. He's a cold murderer. It's like Raymond Patriarca or something like that. He kills people all the time. You know, does Trump people, not, not, yeah. not Trump and his, uh, does the Trump administration survive this? I don't think Trump will serve out his term. Okay. Yeah, but yeah, I could have a pile <laughs> over my face. And I, I realize. Matt Brown could yeah. win. Trump not serving out his yeah, term. Yeah, yeah. I always, think there's too much baggage. But I always want to get your take yeah. on politics. But let's. I want to talk about mold. You want to talk about yeah, mold? Right. You, you you read my I mind. Mean, yeah. <laughs> One of the big stories that Go Local has been continuing to work yeah. on here is allegations by residents who have lived in Brady Sullivan properties. These are renovated mills. Renovated Beautiful mills. brick and stone mill buildings. Right. And there's a number around, both Rhode Island, Brady yeah. Sullivan has been uh, under scrutiny and duress in other states around New England. This is nothing uh, new for It's amazing. The I was just reviewing it before we went on the air. It's all over the place. The question is, wh why is he still running a business? Well, What's going on So here? here's my question to you is th yeah. the state involvement. Right now it's yeah. going through sort of legal channels. We had a doctor in here who said that he had spoken with a number of the patients, of course, Brady Sullivan is fighting back, but take the example yeah. of the Hope Artiste Village. A number of tenants had been That's upset the one in Pawtucket. That's popular place. That yeah. they were yeah. upset with the way things had uh, transpired between them and uh, Lance Robbins. Right. The state came in, intervened, and said, "We're going to put a legal team in place that can address any of these complaints that might come to to to, to bear." Right. But where is the state in all of this? These are residents. Well, I think the state, <laughs> especially given how much property he has, and given his record all over New England, the state should come right in and, frankly, get him out of here. He shouldn't be. He should not. Have, he should not be a developer in this state. He shouldn't be a developer anywhere. I, I looked up in the record and the, the background. I mean, there are EPA stuff. Uh, there was a lead poisoning problem in one of them. I mean, it's just one thing after another. Now, he is based in New Hampshire. I don't know. But do we have extradition? I don't know. Well, but, he does get but, historic yeah. tax credits. He's not getting anything right, from right, commerce at this right, point. So right. the same structure that was but, but placed in Lance state, Robbins. But that is a state program. That is a state the program. question is, should he have it? And then, mm. you, then you get into the quandary. I mean, you want these buildings to mm. be safe. They're beautiful. They're, they're structurally sound. So what's the, uh, you know, what's the, the back and forth uh, between the health risk and the the, the natural desire to save these buildings. And there, we need more housing in the state. We need more affordable housing. This is very, very difficult. But looking at his record, not only here, but all over New England, I don't think people should be doing business with him. We'll see what happens yeah, moving forward. Yeah. We just I'm not going to run today. a studio apartment <laughs> over there. I'll tell you that much. Do you have your cheat sheet? Yeah. Can we, do we know what we yeah, can expect this sure. weekend? Yeah, I talked about Connor Lamb, you know, sort of a lunch, kind of the return of the Truman Democrat, the old-fashioned Truman Democrat. I love uh, Trump blocking the, uh, bro the, uh, the effort by Broadcom, mm. which is a Singapore company, by Qualcomm, because you got to protect this intellectual property. There are national security implications if we let a foreign company buy Qualcomm, who's very big in mobile networks. Mm. Uh, there with military applications, other national security operations, and we don't want the Chinese getting in that. Yeah, this is a Singapore company. Broadmoor is a Singapore company, but you know, uh, China is a huge power, ever increasing power in East Asia. You know, which you write about yeah. regularly. Yeah. Your concerns yeah, yeah, <laughs> pertaining yeah. to Chinese-American relations. I've been worried about that. Confucius Institute, Confucius Institute. Okay. Hello, URI. <laughs> it's a URI too. Yes, yes. It? They've got yes. to get rid of those people. And I, the other thing I'm touting, uh, I've done some reading about all these power failures we've had. It's just not every other tree is falling over. One almost hit you. Yeah. I don't know all about that. <laughs> Um, you know, we need more microgrids, these sort of autonomous, small area 
uh, electric grid. So they, you know, to reduce the, uh, how do I put the, the extent of, yes. uh, of uh, outages. We really need that. We obviously need more uh, alternative energy uh, so we aren't as dependent upon the grid. Uh, so that, but on, on the happy note of, of the energy, we've given these gigantic windmills, which I hope are not blown down in the next storm, <laughs> over near the central landfill, 560 feet high. I think this is great. You know, we're going to, you know, showing local, locally produced energy. It doesn't make us so dependent upon the very heavily strained gas pipeline system. But this energy outage problem, it just seems to get worse and worse and worse. And so we need to restructure the grid. Well, we'll see. We're yeah. keeping an eye next week. Yeah. Hopefully we don't get oh, hit what, with another one. One other thing. One so other I, thing. I mentioned, you know, I'm pretty, uh, having been an immigrant in a sense in another country for a while, myself, I'm very sympathetic. But you cannot have cities and states making up their own immigration law, which California keeps trying to do. I mean, California's got 40 million people, lots of illegal aliens. You can understand the, why they would do that. But I think, um, you know, I, I just think we've got to be very leery of that. If you don't like the immigration laws, you know, vote for somebody to go to Congress to change them. Well, is it is it a factor of the void that we're seeing of yeah. leadership in DC of the of that of that they're yeah. saying? Well, we're going to try to. Yeah, no, um, nothing's happened. You need a, the what the French <laughs> call changement de regime. Uh, you know, one part of the other should have sort of overwhelming control of Congress, then actually pass a law, which would be very unusual. <laughs> and very this unusual. and yeah. this day and age, absolutely. Before yeah. I let you go, Bob, yeah. you or I, Duke, tomorrow, yeah. who's going to win? You're right. Okay, go Rams. Right. My, my psychiatrist told me to say that. <laughs> we'll be right back here actually talking about the URI Duke game with Ben Kinch, WRIU's play by play man. Don't go anywhere, we'll be right back. That's why. Hi everyone, welcome back to the Navigant Credit Union Broadcast Center. I'm Go Local News Editor Kate Nagel. I'd like to welcome back a familiar face. He has been giving us his inside scoop to the URI Rams, Ben Kinch, WRIU's play-by-play -play general manager, senior at URI. Ben, thanks for joining us today. Hey, happy to, happy to be here, Kate. I love being on with you guys at Go Local. We're, uh, we're in for a good one tomorrow. That's for sure. We are in for a good one tomorrow. Did you catch the PC game this afternoon? I was able to watch a little bit of it, yeah. They had the availability for the Rhode Island and the Duke players while that was going on, so they had the games on in the media room, which is nice because you're able to see okay. all the uh, the games that are going on while you're getting your work done. So I did get to see that game. Tough one for the Friars. They had a good season all year long. I think they uh, far superseded everyone's expectations. You knocked off Xavier twice in a season. You knocked off Villanova once. Uh, so Ed Cooley had, you know, five NCAA bids in a row, despite only winning the one. Ed Cooley has that program in an upward trajectory. Speaking of upward trajectory, then there was one. All eyes are on URI versus Duke, 2.40 p.m. tomorrow afternoon. Let's take a little rewind because we didn't get the opportunity to talk with you after their win. Let's talk about the position that URI is in that you've seen from the last game before we look at the matchups with the Blue Devils. Rhode Island's in a really good position right now. The best thing for me about the Oklahoma game on Thursday was they did a lot of key things down the stretch that they didn't do in games like that St. Joe's game 
in the A-10 tournament, or especially the Davidson game. Okay. They hit key free throws down the stretch. Cyril Langevin, who is uh, north of a 50% free throw shooter, hit four key free throws down the stretch. And Fats Russell, who had a phenomenal game against uh, freshman of the year in the NCAA, Trey Young, uh, he hit his free throws down the stretch as well, and they also hit clutch shots and were able to lock people down defensively. So what has Rhode Island in such a great position, even better so than a week ago when they were still in postseason play in the A-10s, uh, is that they're, they're executing perfectly. They're doing exactly what they need to do down the stretch, and that's why they're able to, to win in overtime, a game that probably shouldn't have even gone to overtime because that, that final shots by uh, – by Stan Robinson, hung on the rim for what felt like uh, an hour. Uh, so we finally went to overtime. But they stepped up. E.C. Matthews finally uh, was able to get that March moment that he missed uh, in that Oregon game last year, a very clutch three-pointer. So Rhode Island's in, in a very good position right now. What will they need to improve upon, Ben, going into the game against the Blue Devils tomorrow? What will they have to tighten up that they can't afford to make any mistakes on to bring their A game to bring it to the Blue Devils? So you need to tighten up on the guard play, which is obviously their strong suit. And the reason I don't say in the paint, which is where they're going to get beat, is because Duke has these incredible front court players. Marvin Bagley III is going to be a lottery pick. He's easily going in the top five in the NBA draft this year. He's the ACC player of the year and the freshman of the year. He's only the second player to ever hold both of those accomplishments in one season. The uh, first was Jaleel Okafor in 2015 another Duke player, so, so Duke knows what it's like to have a kind of play like this. But the way I stuck around and I saw that Iona-Duke game right after the Rhode Island-Oklahoma game, and the way he gets open offensively is, is not only a testament to the way Coach K runs his offense, but he's so quick for a big man. He's so athletic and agile, and he finds himself open in the, these uh, situations where he, he gets himself – uh, perfect positions to score. Uh, how, he, he how is URI going to be able to defend against that? They have they have trouble with the pick and roll. Uh, yeah. You know he's a, he is. How is URI going to be able to step up to that? Well, it's going to be tough. Andre Berry, the starter for Rhode Island, is not really a defensive big man. They put him in there for the offensive efforts. So it's it's really going to come down to really your lone big man defender in Rhode Island, and that's that's uh, Cyril Langevin. Langevin has been. Really fantastic this season, defending the ball in the low post, okay. which is where Bagley gets a lot of his offense. Yep. Uh, he he's, he's leads the team in blocks, does Langevin. So it, it's going to be a hard matchup for him. Don't, don't get me wrong. I mean, you're talking <laughs> literally one of the best players in the country coming into this game. Yep. Uh, but if, if you're going to tighten up, you need to bring the double team. Uh, so it's going to be Langevin and Robinson kind of collapsing down on Bagley anytime he gets out. And then that goes to the guards. Then you need to tighten up because – somebody's going to be left open, so you need to get back on that, that three-point perimeter defense because Duke also loves to shoot the three ball. You talk about the guard play as being important. What are the other key matchups between the Rams and the Blue Devils? It's, well, Grace Nowen. Uh, he is the lone senior on this team, and actually I was able to ask Coach K uh, a question, which was actually that by itself was, was pretty cool. Um, <laughs> but I asked Coach K, I said, Rhode Island brings in five seniors, and yeah. Duke only brings in one, and that's Grace Nowen. So I asked him, what that senior leadership does, and he said it, it means the world because so many of these kids for Duke are freshmen. Yes, uh, yeah. Uh, yesterday was their first NCAA game, and they got the jitters out. But Grace Allen's been there before, so the matchup you need to look at besides Bagley is Grace Allen. He's he scored 30 points multiple times a season. He's lethal from beyond the arc. Mm -hmm. So what I would expect is Rhode Island to put Fats Russell right in his lap. Okay. Because the job that he did yesterday on Trey Young especially in the second half. I mean, Trey Young hit all four of his shots in the first half. He had 10 points going into halftime. And over the stretch of the next 10 minutes, he was completely taken out of his comfort zone. And that's because of the fast pace, in-your-face play of Fats Russell. So if Fats can bring that kind of effort and intensity on defense against Grayson Allen, then they have a very good shot of limiting his ability from beyond the arc. And he, he can go deep beyond the arc as well. I mean, how do you defend the deep three? Well, the deep three is tough. I mean, we, and we've seen a lot of players so far, even in the game yesterday for URI, Jared Terrell hit a, th a deep three ball to tie it up at 44 right from the center logo. So th those real deep balls are tough to defend. Uh, but Rhode Island is one of the better defensive teams, especially around the perimeter in the country. They come in to tomorrow's game ranked at 78. So they know how to get there. They're quick guards. That's, that's what helps them do that is 
the guards are so athletic and so quick that they're able to get to that matchup. And play, you know, any team is not going to have a lot of time to get a quick shot off. Mm-hmm. So that that's the reason I think Rhode Island's going to be able to lock up uh, Grace now, at least from deep. He's going to get his points. Him and Bagley, these guys are, <laughs> have these consecutive streaks of double digits. So they're going to get their points. But it's about not letting them get deep into the 20s or deep into the 30s. It's about limiting, not exactly neutralizing. And what are we going to see from the Rams' offense? Rams offense, you're probably going to see a lot of, of three balls because it, it, I would expect this to be a shootout okay. because with the, the big trees, the defensive big men for Duke and the paint, you're not going to get a lot of easy opportunities driving to the basket. So you're going to need to, to utilize that screen at the top of the arc, and you're going to need to get guys like E.C. Matthews open. Fats is going to have to be able to shoot from three, so is down. And then you really want to see Jared Terrell have a good performance because he he starts off a little hot in these games but then he starts to fizzle out in the second half at least that's what we've seen in these last couple postseason games but if you can get Jared Drell shooting with um, efficiency from beyond the arc along with a couple of these other Rhode Island players then you're going to be in a pretty good position and so we're getting the breakdown of the game tomorrow but there are some big names who are bullish on URI Charles Barkley has them in his bracket talk with us about your reaction to that people could see URI pulling off this upset. It's almost exactly what you saw last year with uh, Kenny the Jet Smith actually had Rhode Island beating Oregon. He called them at one point the hottest team in the tournament. And that's true. Rhode Island was riding, uh, I think it was a 12 or a 13 win streak coming into the NCAAs last year. Uh, the win streak's not there, but this is a team that uh, gained its momentum after stumbling a little bit, especially with that Oklahoma win. I mean, anytime you beat a national talent like Trey Young and a power five school, you're going to have some momentum going in. Uh, And that's obviously a great win for the A-10. The players talked about that a little bit today. So they have some momentum coming in. Uh, But really, it's no shock. I mean, if you're a person or an an analysis who knows college basketball, then you really shouldn't be shocked that some of these guys are picking Rhode Island because they have that, that senior leadership and experience and these notable wins and a good resume that while they're not clearly the favorite versus Duke, you don't expect them to get blown out by 15 or or 20 points. You would expect them to at least keep it close and have a fighting chance versus Duke. So it's nice to get this national exposure, but if you followed Rhode Island, you know that that's, that's been part of the game these last couple, these last couple seasons. So you mentioned being able to toss out a question to coach K. What did we hear from Hurley today? A lot of the questions were at least, at the beginning were directed to the Hurley's um, connections with Duke basketball and Coach K. Obviously, Dan Hurley's brother, Bobby Hurley, played at Duke, and uh, they, they talked a little bit about that NCAA tournament game, Duke versus Seton Hall, Bobby Hurley versus uh, Dan Hurley. So that was a lot of fun. So a lot of that came up, and there were some laughs and, and some good memories that both coaches were able to share with the press. So that was really fun. But basically, he said, uh, he, he said Rhode Island – is focused. He says the guys are not letting that Duke mystique come in because a lot of the times when Duke's able to beat these opponents is because they're afraid of the name Duke. They know the five championships that Duke has. They know that they have one of, if not the best coach in the NCAA and all these lottery picks that come in. So Rhode Island's not afraid. And I think a big factor of that is the fact that they played this team last year in that uh, early season tip-off challenge over at Mohegan Sun. So Rhode Island played Duke last year, so they're, they're at least a little familiar, uh, which helps. And it's, uh, it's good to see that these guys are not letting the March mystique and the Duke mystique rattle them because they seem as calm and as confident as I've seen them all season. So are we going to see uh, a lot of roadie blue there tomorrow? Of course, it's going to be a sea of blue. It's <laughs> both blue. What do we expect from roadie fans? You're going to see a lot of Keeney blue. Uh, the turnout for the Oklahoma game yesterday was nothing short of fantastic. Anytime Trey Young would hit a three in the first half, it, would, it wouldn't be that you'd hear the Oklahoma Sooner fans cheer. It'd be more that you'd hear the Rhode Island fans groan because they outnumbered the, the Sooner fans uh, by a, a pretty wide margin. So it was loud. It, it was a roadie home game without a doubt. And it was really the same thing last year in that first round versus Creighton, and then again with Oregon, you know, you think Oregon being so much closer to Sacramento last year that Oregon would have had a larger fan base. There was a lot of Keeney Blue that came out last year, and a lot more came out this year just because Pittsburgh was so close to Rhode Island. So it's, it's nice to see that this fan base, you know, besides just the team, that the fan base is making a turnaround. Because I'll be the one to say it, these, these Rhode Island fans 
at, at times in the past couple of seasons that could be a little fair weather. You know, if, if they lose that game like Fordham last year, then, you know, there were people calling for Dan Hurley's job. But now that they're so, you know, the, the Rams are doing such a great job, a lot of people are coming out. A lot of people are coming out to support. And they know that this Rhode Island team is a special one. And this is, if, if there's a team in the past couple of years for Rhode Island that could beat Duke, you know, they've lost four straight to him, all the matchups they've ever had with Duke. But if there is a team that can do it on this fifth attempt, it's going to be this team. And you're down there play-by-play -play with WRIU, but what's the word back on campus? Folks going to turn out, it's, it's going to be at Keeney, yeah? So they going to show the game there? Yeah, they'll, they'll show the game all around campus. They'll have, uh, I mean, it's tough because students are on spring break at this point. Mm -hmm. So there's not a lot of bodies on campus, but they do have these off-campus viewing parties at some of the local restaurants. But with all the, the friends that I've been texting back and forth with, it's, it's, everyone's just excited to be here, to have your team the tournament after not making it since 1999. I mean, there was uh, so many classes that came through the halls of URI that weren't able to experience something like this. So everybody back in Rhode Island, I think, is just enjoying it and having fun. And, you know, this is the Dan Hurley is the first coach for the University of Rhode Island to win round of 64 games back to back in consecutive seasons. So it, it's, it's uncharted territory for for these, these Ram fans. You know, you really don't know what to do with yourself. In the round of 32 so often, you know, these last couple of years, you're, you're watching other teams. You're, you're looking at how your bracket's doing. You're not worried about these Rams because they've already gone home for the year. Now it's fun because you still have uh, a dog and a uh, horse in the race. So let's talk about the bigger bracket picture. Of course, you've been watching the other first round games. Who are you keeping an eye on? Who's been, uh, you know, let's talk upsets. Let's talk about teams to watch. So now it's, now I just want utter mayhem. So I, I, I did a serious bracket this year and my champion was Arizona. <laughs> So obviously Arizona lost to Buffalo. You, you and Charles Barkley. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, but I knew Buffalo was going to be a tough matchup for them because Buffalo played Rhode Island early, earlier in this season. They did an exhibition game, uh, a hurricane relief charity game at the Ryan Center. And Nate Oates has done a fantastic job with that program. He, he was in the conversation for a couple of those bigger jobs that are opening up. Mm -hmm. Now after this win beating what, who could potentially be the number one pick in the NBA draft in DeAndre Ayton. Yeah. I mean, he's on a totally different pedestal now. So Nate Oates did himself a lot of favors. So I, I'd like to see them go pretty far. Yeah. They're going to be a tough matchup for Kentucky uh, tomorrow. Uh, obviously, we saw Wichita State go down to Marshall. Um, keep an eye on New Mexico State. They have a good matchup coming up with Clemson. They won their conference on so New Mexico State. I have them in the Sweet 16. Uh, but once your bracket gets busted, at least from my perspective, you just want complete and total. <laughs> yeah, I want to see some two seeds losing. I want to see a one seed go down for the first time. So at this point, I just want utter March you want, madness. You want mayhem. You and Barkley at Arizona winning. But, of course, you both have your eye over Duke tomorrow, 2.40 p.m. We will be tuning in if you want to listen to Ben Kinch, WRIU, play-by-play. -play. Senior at URI has been giving us his Insights and perspective as URI is now making its way to the second round in the NCAAs. Ben, appreciate your taking the time to Skype in. Happy to do it. Okay, we'll let you go. Thanks, Kate. <laughs> okay, thanks. Ben Kinch, URI senior manager at WRIU and play-by-play, -play, has been giving us his perspective here at the Navigant Credit Union Broadcast Center. URI versus Duke tomorrow, 2.40 p.m. I'm sure a lot of eyes will be on that game tomorrow. Appreciate his breaking down the key matchups and giving us his insights here at Go Local. Ooh. So thanks for tuning in. It was a busy Friday afternoon. We kicked off 2 o'clock with Olivia King in the Alex and Ani Lounge singing her new release. She was signed before Sony to release that song. It was great. Be sure to listen to it. We'll have that on our lineup as well tomorrow. Molly O'Brien at 3 o'clock. Food Friday, a js Bakery in Cranston talking oysters as well. And then at the 4 o'clock hour, had Bob Witt come in, Go Local columnist. Appreciate getting his perspective. So we wish everyone a great weekend, a great Friday night. Stay tuned for URI coverage on GoLocalProv.com. More news, lifestyle, politics, and sports on Facebook and GoLocalProv.com. I'm GoLocal News Editor Kate Nagel.